Uh, and now I'm going to introduce Margaret Crawford, uh, who holds a degree in architectural history, housing, and urban planning. Her involvement with urban design began in uh, late 1990s when she co-thought urban design studios at SIAR. That led to the co-edited book, one of the essential books in American urbanism called Everyday Urbanism with John Kaliski and late John Chase. The book made a significant impact leading Doug Calbo to call it one of the three leading paradigms today in urban design. Before coming to Berkeley, uh, uh, Margaret Crawford chaired the History, Theory, and Humanities program at SciArc in Los Angeles. And from 2000 to 2009, was professor of urban design and planning theory at the Harvard Graduate School of Design teaching history and design workshops and studios. Her scholarly work includes building the workman's, working man's paradise, the history of American company towns, the car and the city, the automobile, the built environment and daily urban life, along with, along with numerous articles and uh, book chapters on immigrant spatial practices, shopping malls, public space and other issues in American built environments since 2003. Crawford, since 2003, Crawford has been investigating the effects of rapid physical and social changes on villages in China, China's Pearl River Delta. She recently co-edited critical texts in Chinese urbanization a four volume collection of English language studies of Chinese urban development among many other publications she uh, participated and written. So without any further introduction, I would like to introduce Margaret Crawford and, and tell her our appreciation and gratitude for her to take her time and talking to us here in East Los Angeles College. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you so much, uh, Orhan. I'm really happy to be here today and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back in Los Angeles, even if it's only uh, remotely. So shall I share my screen? Yes. Okay, let's see. Okay, so um, everyday urbanism, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, everyday urbanism uh, uh, has gone through several iterations. Uh, it is a book that- uh, I'm sorry, we don't see your screen. Oh, you can't see my screen? Oh, do I need to push share? Wait a second, let me find what's going on here. Okay, how can I deal with this? Let me see. Um, just a second. I'm trying to get it. Um, hmm. It should be at the bottom of your um, share screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, somehow it's not working. Let me check. Okay. Hmm. The old days, it was the projector. Nowadays, it's just yeah, of course. Now it's There's something Zoom. always happening in architectural. We've lectures. all been there. <laughs> okay, I'm just trying to get get to having it show something here, but it's not really working. Um, hmm. Gilbert, is there any way that you can help her? I think it has to be me here doing something, but um, let me uh, end the. Let me see if I can get it to quit. Nope. Page needs to be open on your computer. I don't know if that's the Yeah, page. it is completely open. That's I think that's the problem. I can't get to the Zoom instructions, which should be either below or above. Escape. Try escape and then. Oh, okay. That's a good idea. Okay. Escape did it. Thank you. That's perfect. Okay. So I need to then 
um, go, go to share to, screen. Yeah. Yeah. I need to go back to zoom and share screen. Okay. Okay. There we go. Uh, okay. We're on. Okay. You can see it. Great. Okay. All right. Is that okay? Perfect. Now we can see All right. it. Okay. Old school teaching. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, everyday urbanism is a concept um, that uh, John Chase uh, and John Kaliski uh, and I uh, kind of created in the 1990s based on our experiences here in Los Angeles. Uh, John Chase uh, was unfortunately deceased, but uh, was a uh, urban designer. He was the urban designer for the city of West Hollywood. John Kaliski is also an architect and urban designer who has an urban design firm still uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, the thing that really inspired us was the life that we saw around us in Los Angeles. Um, driving on the city streets, uh, we saw amazing things. And we felt that in the 1990s urban design discourse, uh, nobody else was paying attention to these things. Um, that there were all kinds of, and I think you get a sense from the cover here, this is a mural on a liquor store, which uh, it says uh, Santa Monica Lewinsky um, Freeway. And probably this was before your time. You probably weren't even born then, but um, this was a big scandal at the time. So this is a joke mural um, painted on a very typical kind of Los Angeles uh, street that had a lot of information on it. Uh, so Los Angeles was really the inspiration. And then we tried to conceptualize what we thought was so exciting. And just to go back in history and think of the 1990s, uh, what were the dominant forms of urban discourse in Los Angeles? One was the new urbanism, which basically disapproved almost completely of everything in Los Angeles and wanted to replace it with, um, I guess, different versions of uh, the Grove, uh, basically a kind of fabricated small town urbanism. And the other thing we saw was basically people who were trying to uh, completely ignore uh, what was actually on the ground and create very abstract patterns um, based on Peter Eisenman's idea of um, kind of uh, over overlays of different um, pa uh, urban patterns. So that was the atmosphere and we wanted to do something uh, that really reflected what was going on in the city. And I think you can see it came out with one book uh, in 1999. Uh, later in 2004, we produced a second edition, uh, which had additional uh, chapters based on a lot of the contacts we made from the response to the original book. And then finally last year, Everyday Urbanism was actually translated into Chinese um, and has now been published in China. Okay, uh, so how can you even think about the kind of uh, multiplicity and even chaos of uh, the urban life of Los Angeles? Uh, so one of the things we tried to do to understand it was to use theories that existed. Um, and of course, usually theories are done by French people. Um, so kind of we adopted a number of concepts of everyday life um, from, for example, the sociologist and philosopher Henri Lefebvre, who wrote a um, very interesting book about everyday life. Again, everyday life is so pervasive. It's everywhere and nowhere. Everyone has an everyday life. So how can you manage to even conceptualize what it is? Um, and Henri Lefebvre gave us some clues. And then another author, Michel de Certeau, um, who came up with some ideas also about how everyday life is structured. So using these kind of theories that gave us a way to try to make some sense out of this topic of everyday life. Um, and so just to give you a sense of what kind of what we learned, 
Uh, Lefebvre's idea was that there are two kinds of temporality that are constantly interacting in everyday life. And one is this idea of natural time, um, which has to do with weather. It has to do with day and night. It has to do with the passage from birth to death, um, which are all things that are uh, experienced in a very... Uh, uh, Lefebvre's idea was that there are two kinds of temporality that are constantly interacting in is that life and one that is interfering in natural is. time, um, which has to do with weather. It has to do with day and night. It has to do. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the other is the imposed time. And I think you can see that this is the imposition of really the economy that divides our time into discrete elements like the workday, right? From nine to five, the lunch break, when you get a little time for yourself, uh, the week, you know, the work week and the work weekend. Uh, so all of these are ways that are artificially imposed on us. And so there are these two different, very different kinds of temporality. Um, for, from Disarto, we learned the idea of strategies and tactics. Um, strategies are the weapons of the powerful, such as urban plans, that's right. Um, people, uh, strategies are really about owning land and then deciding what to do with it. And then tactics are the responses of people who actually have to accommodate themselves uh, to other strategies produced by others. And you can see tactics are things like these desire lines um, you're supposed to go on the orthogonal uh, path, but in fact, people actually create their own paths. And so these two uh, forces, strategies, the powerful, and tactics, uh, the weak, uh, are in constant combat throughout the world um, and throughout history. Um, people are trying to impose a kind of spatial order, um, and they have the power to do it but then human beings are actually accommodating themselves and coming up, finding opportunities and using those opportunities um, to do what they want. So um, one of the first things that we were very clear about in conceptualizing uh, everyday urbanism was it was about lived experience, uh, not abstraction. And I think what we can see if we look at ur uh, urban planning in particular, um, the, the real world is abstracted and plans are made um, based on abstractions. And they can be statistical abstractions like the famous multiple regression analysis, uh, or they can be physical abstractions like land use maps um, or in architecture, uh, they can be abstractions of reality into these black and white uh, diagrams. So we said no abstraction, that abstraction is uh, something that separates um, people, particularly educated people, particularly designers, um, from the reality of life, human life, and lived experience. Okay. Uh, and so the other principle that we came up with was specificity. Uh, obviously, there is no every, general you, everyday life, right? There can be no generalizable um, circumstance uh, that can, can people share. Uh, everyday life has to be specific and specifically located in a particular place. And so it's no accident that this theory came out of Los Angeles and highly specific things that we saw. Um, so we really started um, at the top with some theory, but the importance of the actuality of the city at that time uh, is probably even more important. So specificity is really um, a key to this. And uh, we really argue that uh, specificity uh, is the only way to understand the, the world. Um, you have to really look at concrete examples. And so these are the things that we saw around us in Los Angeles uh, at that time. I think they're still present. Um, you know, one is certainly the uh, city that is still very much based on the automobile. 
Um, and the other is the proliferation of what we might call informal activities. Um, all kinds of people in the course of um, creating livelihoods and lives who um, are active in the public realm of Los Angeles. So it has very much to do with the specific nature of this city. Uh, and I don't think that we would have come up with uh, this book if it, we had lived anywhere else. Okay, let me see. Why am I not being able to move? Okay. So uh, again, back to what was going on in the discourse and what continues to go on in the discourse. And, you know, this is not necessarily a criticism of these things. They have to exist. Um, certainly what was happening in Los Angeles in 2000 was downtown redevelopment, some, a process that is still continuing. And you could see the images of what that looks like here um, in these plans and renderings. Um, very, very dramatic uh, transformations of the city. Uh, other examples, new urbanism, and this is the kind of imagery that uh, new urbanists uh, wanted to impose on Los Angeles. Again, uh, kind of a small scale, uh, highly designed uh, reproduction of earlier places that may have never lived in Los, uh, may have never existed in Los Angeles, that's for sure. Um, the other was the creative cities discourse um, created by somebody like Richard Florida. Um, the idea that artists should be, uh, in a way, the creators of new areas of the city, um, such as the arts district. Uh, and that is a more, uh, I think, a more compelling type of uh, redevelopment, um, which isn't about big buildings, but is about creative activities. So all of these things are going on at, in Los Angeles. Um, the other is iconic architecture. And certainly Los Angeles is known for its iconic architecture. Um, and here, I think we see some examples. And the other is the kind of bottom up idea of trying to uh, create a very, very different kind of city um, in which uh, people will not drive cars, they will ride bikes. And um, the city needs to uh, focus on these different kinds of transportation. So this is the context um, that uh, existed around the turn of the 21st century. Let me see, why am I not able to? Okay, now, um, just, okay. And what we saw was something really different. Um, what we saw was a whole set of activities that um, were actually transformative. Um, they seemed really minor. And in fact, I think most city planners thought they were problem, uh, problems that needed to be uh, taken care of. And one of the most inspirational things we saw, um, in fact, John Kaliski and I, as we drove up La Brea Boulevard on our way home from Cyarc um, to where we lived, was this taco stand um, that basically at five o'clock, or five thirty? Sorry, um, at five thirty, it stopped being a oil change uh, and kind of used car uh, sales place. Um, they closed the gates and then they opened up again, and it became an outdoor taco stand. Um, so this seemed to be a really exciting. Uh, kind of multiple uses based on temporality. It was actually popular. Um, a lot of people um, would go there and uh, especially when it got dark, uh, eat, eat tacos. So this suggested that there were other ways of thinking about what was going on in the city based on time uh, more than uh, space, that actually time could alter space. We also saw day laborers um, waiting for work, and this was a highly controversial uh, topic at the time. Uh, day laborers uh, waited outside of Home Depot in order to get hired. Um, there was a lot of contestation about this, um, but in, uh, in many respects, they were also serving a need um, that in fact was, um, they waited outside because people would hire them. We saw people like this couple 
who took uh, waiting at the bus stop. They took their um, portraits onto the bus and actually got clients um, from the bus from bus other bus riders. And then the other thing that we saw were um, uh, were garage sales everywhere in the city. And this probably had to do with the economic downturn of the 1990s in which a lot of people um, tried to make money from garage sales. And you can see that this garage sale right here is not really on, um, on, on private space. Usually garage sales will be in the driveway or a front yard. This is actually on public space. Uh, and the public's land that on the other between the sidewalk and the street. So we kept seeing examples of this everywhere in the city. And this made us think that these are new and complex uses of urban space that no one was paying attention to. Um, not incidentally, they were all illegal. Um, the idea of having a taco stand in an oil change place, I'm not sure it would really get by the health department. Um, even though apparently the tacos were really good. So all of these things were ongoing struggles. Um, one of the interesting things that happened during this time is that um, some cities in Los Angeles, such as Beverly Hills, tried to control um, and limit garage sales. Um, people in Beverly Hills, this is what alerted me to the significance of it. People in Beverly, uh, the city of Beverly Hills um, was concerned because so many people were having garage sales. And not only were they having, say, a garage sale on the weekend, they would actually, after they sold everything they had, would buy stuff and have a permanent garage sale in their garage. Um, so the city tried to restrict garage sales to one. You could only have one every six months. So obviously, even in the most expensive neighborhoods of Los Angeles, People were following these informal activities and you know, activities that you don't necessarily associate with those kind of neighborhoods. So we thought that these, um, all of these things were actually uh, needed to be paid attention to. Uh, the other thing we saw was street vending everywhere. Um, this is actually on La Brea and Slauson, right by the McDonald's there. And so what's really astonishing, this woman, this is her homemade jewelry um, that she was selling. And right in back of her is McDonald's. And I think if you think of McDonald's as being a, you know, a very generic and even harsh environment with the parking lot, yet she was selling uh, on this velvet, a table with a velvet tablecloth, very intricate and beautifully handmade jewelry. So the contrast between what she was doing and the place where she was doing it um, is really strong and the kind of very human um, quality that someone is selling something that they made in uh, front of the mat fast food uh, parking lot is something that's really striking. Um, so the idea is, you know, what can you learn um, from these people these objects and these places. And you have to analyze all three. Um, these are people creating these things. They are not um, abstract forces like city planning or uh, economic development or real estate development. They're actually people. Um, they are doing it through objects and we'll look at a whole series of objects and the places they are doing it are also really important. And so, um, when I say, what can we learn? I'm saying, I'm asking, what can architects, uh, designers learn from these play people, places, and, um, and objects? One, they can serve important and useful purposes. Um, vendors in particular, if vendors don't have customers, uh, they go away, right? And vendors really serve a lot of important purposes. Um, certainly in New York and in many places, uh, you the second it starts to rain, vendor, vendors are going to appear on the street with cheap umbrellas and sell them. Um, so you don't need to make sure you carry your umbrella. And here's uh, the umbrella sellers. Uh, you know, literally the second it starts to rain, they're going to be there. 
And here are some, and one of the really good sources for finding out what people think about this is things like Yelp. And so here is a uh, umbrella vendor um, saying that he's done it for three years. He's doing a public service to make sure people are dry. And if you know people from New York, they usually have a whole bunch of these vendor umbrellas um, because they're cheap and you always need them. So they provide a service that's really important. And you know it's always discouraging to be in a city where that's not happening when you go out on the street uh, and it rains and there's no vendor selling an umbrella. Uh, and in Los Angeles, of course, we know these fruit vendors. And these are really positive reviews of fruit vendors from Yelp. Um, here's a couple of five-star um, reviews of street of street vendors. And here, a guy driving around, uh, a woman, yeah, driving around for 15 minutes trying to find one particular stand and how good it is. So um, vendors would not exist unless they're customers. And that is because they serve real needs. And I know many people who actually buy fruit from vendors um, because in Los Angeles, uh, because it's healthy, it's good, and um, it's reasonably priced. So vending is something that wouldn't exist unless it serves a purpose. Um, so the second thing that people should learn is that instead of trying to eliminate them, uh, they should be legalized. And of course, this is a ongoing struggle in Los Angeles. Um, for many years, I, struck, I, I studied vendors who were trying to have vending legalized in the city of Los Angeles. Um, vending was completely illegal, yet yeah, look at the picture on the bottom, um, yeah, vending was everywhere. Uh, and so organizations came together to support the right of people um, to participate in the economy on the sidewalk and legalize vending. Um, some people think that vending is a, a sign of desperation, uh, that you know only if you're desperate will you go out on the street to sell things, but in actual fact, that is not the case. Um, vending is, uh, you have to be organized to be a vendor. Um, you have to find the right product to sell. And so it really is just another form of economic activity, of commercial activity that in fact is not desperate at all. It is well thought through. And you know there are famous people on the streets of Los Angeles, of course, selling tamales especially. Um, finally, uh, vending was legalized um, and yet uh, it has still not been worked out. It's still, again, the places you can vend and obviously, this goes back to the, uh, you know, the usefulness of vending. Uh, typically, when vending gets legalized, um, it is only uh, allowed in certain places, but that might not be the place where the vendor actually knows that they need to be in order to sell their goods. So vending is still a fraught subject, but I personally would really like to see designers supporting uh, vending uh, and vending activities. And even symbolically, uh, one of the stories in everyday urbanism is uh, a project that Norman Millar, uh, unfortunately also deceased, um, created uh, with students where they designed vending carts. Now, the actual vendors rejected the vending carts <laughs> because um, they were too expensive, uh, heavy, et cetera. But nonetheless, the fact that architecture students were designing them, showed solidarity with vending. And so it was symbolically really important um, because they were supporting vending as an activity. Um, again, day laborers, um, over the past 20 years, um, particularly with help from the UCLA uh, Chicano Study Center, uh, day laborers went from being a problem to actually being allowed to uh, have day labor sites um, that were official uh, in which they can actually set the, uh, the amount of money, they can set what wages they are, they want and agree. They can have official sites where they can uh, 
stand in order to get hired. I mean, uh, there were a lot of problems with day laborers in which day laborers would be hired. They would be taken somewhere, they would work, and then they didn't get paid. So uh, th they have now become really part of the labor market in Los Angeles through these kind of urban struggles. And you can see that these are linked to larger issues of rights of rights in the city and rights to the city. Um, so day laborers have actually been uh, relatively successful in establishing themselves as part of the official labor force of the city. Um, and also uh, they offer new concepts and new ways of thinking about um, the city and design in the city. And one is that um, many vending activities display the interior on the exterior. That is, they really take domestic space and put it in public space. And this softens um, and creates a much more homelike uh, public spaces. And one of the best examples, of course, are these rugs laid on cars um, for sale that all of a sudden what would have been really a very harsh um, environment here becomes soft, it becomes more homelike, it becomes more like the interior uh, rather than the exterior. And I think you all probably are familiar with Los Angeles streetscape in many respects is often very brutal and very harsh with um, materials like chain link fence, et cetera, um, that are not welcoming. So often the human touch of vending, it makes a kind of mural of multiple interiors. Um, for example, the selling using, used clothing on these chain link fences. Again, chain link fence is a kind of classic uh, Los Angeles material, um, but by putting up these used clothes uh, on, on the chain link fence and using it um, as a kind of mural um, creates the story of multiple lives that these uh, this clothing used to belong to. And it tells you, in a way, the individual stories of many, many people. It represents it in public, and it certainly softens the harshness of these uh, of the chain link fence and makes it into something very different, very colorful, very personal. And again, referring to the interior, um, the interior of people's houses, of their closets. Um, food made by hand, and here um, it's very typical um, to have women vendors who have actually made the food themselves um, and wearing aprons, um, which really creates uh, a feeling of a family kitchen, a family dining table um, that also uh, brings domesticity uh, into harsh places like the sidewalk or here, this parking lot. Um, so it actually um, creates a, a kind of care um, that you don't see. It's not the impersonal uh, service of a restaurant. Uh, it creates something that is much more home-like uh, and much more comforting. Um, there's a big discourse now in urban design about care. Uh, and in a way, these women, I think, very, very powerfully um, represent care. Um, they evoke the kitchen uh, where your grandmother could be making tamales uh, and the dining room of uh, the interior. Uh, and they also reveal new economies. Um, one of the most interesting thing about garage sales is that uh, it is the economy of recycling, right? It takes goods that have been bought and they've already lost their value. Uh, but when someone buys them, they will go on to live another life and increase their usefulness. Uh, and certainly the chain of uh, the value of products here goes from, uh, some people can find really worthwhile and valuable things in garage sales because everything is just out there. So they go up the value chain. Um, they can also just go down the value chain and become trash, right? Um, if you didn't sell it, you're just gonna put it in the trash. But for most people, um, they find new uses um, for all of these used things. And this really means you don't have to buy something new. 
Um, it is a alternative economy to, I think we could even say the capitalist economy. It's an economy of recycling um, that uh, exists under what appears to be a commercial transaction. And also, um, I've done a lot of research on garage sales. I've even given a number of garage sales myself as, uh, as part of the research. Um, there also exists a gift economy uh, in the garage sale. Um, there's always usually a free box where things can be given away. And often, especially when the end of the garage sale comes close, people just start, the, the garage sale giver starts to just give away stuff. Uh, I used to bring my daughter, who was a child at the time, to garage sales to do research. And um, people would just give her things. They would say stuff like, um, oh, I, if when I was your age, I would have liked this and given her things that she didn't even ask for or necessarily want. So there is also a gift economy that exists under this kind of com cover of commercialism. So uh, I think they reveal things that are going on in, that are very exciting and innovative um, that you would never really think about. Um, so there are alternatives, there are alternative economies. And they also suggest new ways of thinking about public space. Certainly the garage sale is an incredibly um, radical inversion of what is public and what is private. Um, first of all, the front yard, uh, which is typically a private space um, that uh, not in California, but in some states, trespassers on uh, front yards can actually be shot uh, legitimately, not in California, thank God. Um, but it is a, it's usually a honorific public space that is not well used uh, because it is so public. Um, but the public uh, space of the front yard becomes incredibly private, right? Clothing and other household items from the most private spaces in the house, the closet, the drawer, you know, or the basement or attic, if it exists, um, all of these things from very, very private spaces inside the house are put on the front yard where anyone can come by, look at them, touch them, or buy them. Um, so this is a really uh, dramatic inversion of public and private space. And certainly, I've never come across any uh, cases of people being excluded from garage sales. Um, garage sales are extremely public. Basically, anybody can come. Uh, and again, they can buy something that belonged to you before. So this is really a way that we can change the way we think about public and private space. So it's very, very dramatic in that respect. And I think you can see, again, they all come with stories, the stories of their previous use and existence. And also at garage sales, in fact, those stories are often exchanged as part of the com commercial interaction. People say, oh, I bought this to make curtains, but I never did. Um, and then the person often buying will often say, uh, explain what they're going to do with it. Uh, so it it creates a very unusual kind of sociability, and it's in it's created and enacted through these objects of used clothing and household appliances. So uh, again, they show that you can transform uh, a private space into a public market. Um, this is in East Los Angeles a few years ago, where on the weekend, uh, the truck becomes a display uh, for groceries, for different items. Um, the fence uh, becomes the uh, display for the brooms. You can see the bags there. Um, so this is a way in which you can imagine that, again, time shapes space uh, in, in really different ways. And this starts to break down uh, the barrier that exists um, between residential space and commercial space uh, in, a, in a very interesting and dramatic way. And also, I mean, this is only happens on the weekends um, when this area is transformed into a store. Um, 
but it gives you ideas about how time can play an important role in transforming space. And also, I mean, in American cities, including Los Angeles, uh, very, very severely, uh, zoning, uh, zoning is done on the basis of function. So residential areas, you're not allowed to have commercial spaces in them. Um, yet, uh, and this breaks down that very, very long held barrier between these two functions and makes it easy to have a kind of neighborhood store. Um, and uh, one of the things I also discovered is that um, for many people, the garage sale um, can become a garage store. Um, and in my neighborhood and where I used to live in Hollywood, um, a person uh, had a, a store in their garage and they would just pull up the garage door on the weekend and you could walk in and buy things. So again, this is a pretty dramatic um, challenge to the way in which cities are organized and zoned um, because it introduces these commercial activities uh, in a very painless way uh, into a neighborhood. And I think you can compare this uh, way of creating garage stores to things like live work lofts uh, or other new zoning ideas, even uh, mixed use, which require uh, expensive buildings, right? Um, and this does it with actually no outlay of money um, to transform your garage into a store is much easier than getting live work zoning uh, or other kinds of mixed use projects. Um, this is a way where it happens almost naturally. And uh, one of the problems, of course, with mixed use is that the actual spaces created on the ground floors of a lot of places aren't really suitable for small scale enterprises because the floor plate is typically too big. Uh, and when you drive down the street and you see all of these new buildings that are mixed use, um, there are gonna be a lot of for rent signs uh, because it doesn't work out in the way that they were planned. Uh, any city can only absorb so many ground floor retails. Um, also because they're new construction, the cost is really expensive. So um, this is a painless way to do this. Uh, and there are many, many, here's the vintage clothing store in my neighborhood. Uh, and you can see that that just happened every weekend and was extremely popular. So again, this is another trans transformation of what's public and private, right? Um, a garage, which is supposed to be private storage from your car um, becomes in a public uh, and I think we got a public shop where anyone can go. Uh, and here, I think you can see that this, again, is going to create, um, if you have the idea of a, uh, a garage um, become, becoming a more permanent store or cafe. Uh, I personally, I would love to see somebody's garage in my neighborhood become a cafe, and I can almost guarantee that it would be a place where people in the neighborhood hang out uh, and socialize, uh, as well as also a really good money-making opportunity uh, for the person who either, you know, owns the garage or who rents it for a commercial purpose. So, even starting off with the garage sale and what people are doing, it gives you an idea of kind of exciting new spaces that you can have in an existing city. And again, in an extremely low cost way. Um, the newest thing that is happening in the Bay Area, and I'm not sure if it's happening in Los Angeles, is that backyard, garage and driveway restaurants have recently been legalized. It's happened, the entire state of California has made this happen, but each county has to actually also legalize it. And so people who have famous barbecue recipes, for example, um, here we are in the backyard, can actually um, uh, have people come in and buy their food. And obviously this works to break down that private public barrier. Um, it creates a new kind of socialization where people uh, are guests in your house and it provides money for uh, the people who operate these. Uh, given the high cost of housing, um, almost everybody these days needs to have an extra source of income. So on the one hand, it can be your side hustle um, to bring in some income. 
Um, and so if these spaces, um, one of the things we've noticed are collectively produced, um, they can create communities. And this is the border town skate park. Um, it was built at night um, secretly um, by skaters in Oakland. And it lasted um, for more than 10 years. And you can see here they are. It's under Caltrans land. A lot of people would think is um, not as policed as other kind of urban spaces. And so they built this uh, under the um, under the freeway in Emeryville uh, up here in Northern California. And you can see it was a collective effort. They brought in concrete at night uh, and mixed it up and created their own skate park. Uh, which was very, very popular um, for this particular community. And there are many other examples of these kind of informal uh, skate parks. And so um, it was finally destroyed by Caltrans in 2011, I guess, when they started paying attention. Um, but for 10 years, it, it existed and worked very, very well. Um, this is another story um, about this kind of everyday activity. Uh, a man, you can see that there is a little um, area here that no one claimed. It wasn't private property. Uh, and so people would uh, dump junk there. Um, and so the man who lived nearby got very fed up and he was at the hardware store one day and he saw a concrete Buddha. And I'm trying to locate his concrete Buddha um, sold at the hardware store. So he, he thought if he put the Buddha out there, um, that people it would discourage people from dumping. And uh, there happened to be a Vietnamese community in the neighborhood, a group of Vietnamese residents living there. And so basically, they adopted this uh, Buddha, and they started to build a temple around it. Um, you can it started out as a simple statue, and then they built this shelter from it. Um, they added other Buddha statues. Um, they left offerings, and you can see the offerings here. Um, they started having religious ceremonies here at particular moments of the year. And so it became a uh, really important neighborhood shrine, um, just like you might actually find in Vietnam, Vietnam or Thailand. Um, so it turned into something that was really unexpected. Um, but also brought the neighborhood together and created a, a whole set of kind of community spaces in a, in a very, very amazing way. So um, this is a uh, backyard boxing ring in Los Angeles um, that was started um, in order to get, um, you know, to, to allow neighborhood kids to settle their differences through boxing rather than fighting or anything else. So this guy set up a backyard boxing ring. Um, other people came here. Um, somebody started giving haircuts. Um, they started selling fried chicken. So uh, other kind of neighborhood entrepreneurs come here and um, was a very, very successful community event bringing people together. And of course, what happened typically is that um, the city came in because there were no licenses uh, and shut it down. But the guy who started it is trying to get a license to do this. So all of these activities really um, break down those barriers of a designated use that are so strong in cities. Um, the, the temple, uh, the Buddha temple could never have existed there if it had been an official thing. Um, but once it got started, certainly no one, no one, even in the city, is ever going to um, say that you can't have it anymore. So all of these are really everyday activities that start and suggest um, what can happen um, from the bottom up as people start creating the city. But also, I would say, for designers, uh, it's a way of also appreciating what they do and not seeing it simply as a kind of um, chaos or meaningless or messy or not should not be allowed um, because it has a lot of power and I think designers can definitely learn from it. And so I just wanna go on to say that um, over the past 15 years, 20 years, I've been working a lot in China 
And uh, everyday urbanism is something that is everywhere in China um, in amazingly creative ways in which um, people, um, this is one street in a suburb of Guangzhou and a district of Guangzhou in Southern China um, that over the course of a day um, undergoes a whole host of different changes. Um, people come in the morning um, and you can see they bring vegetables from uh, vegetable plots nearby uh, and they sell them in, uh, in the morning uh, and then they go away. Um, and this is a this is a street that we actually studied uh, in Guangzhou. And so vegetables, both women and men selling them. Uh, at lunchtime, people start selling food. Uh, later on in the evening, it's right by a subway stop. So young workers uh, coming home from their jobs stop and eat in these restaurants that did not um, that appear uh, around five o'clock. Uh, and a lot of young people, they're very inexpensive, stop and eat there. And then later that night, people sell clothing, um, jewelry, and snacks on the street. So this is an amazing example of a kind of uh, constantly uh, evolving um, set of vendors that respond to each of the changing conditions on the street during a typical day. Um, and so this kind of vending is really um, successful, obviously it wouldn't be there uh, unless um, people were buying these things. And you know, one of the interesting things I noticed nearby is that there is a very modern supermarket nearby. Um, this is a very mixed area uh, with people at all income levels living here. And there is a very expensive kind of uh, supermarket with a uh, Hong Kong branch of a Hong Kong supermarket. And there are vendors outside of the supermarket selling vegetables. So, um, so vending is a really widespread, uh, a widespread activity here and highly orchestrated and highly evolved. Um, even in villages, and we've been studying a lot of villages, um, one of the unique characteristics of Chinese villages is that um, villagers are the only people in China who can build their own houses. And that is because this is a right that um, Mao actually gave to rural villagers. Um, but now these villages are no longer rural because the city has grown up to meet them. And so villagers um, have built their own houses. And this is a art village where a lot of artists came to live. And um, the villagers start to um, really create new kinds of housing for them. Um, they take, uh, they upgrade traditional houses, they build modern houses. And then the orange one in number two is a actual villagers house. So they build houses for themselves. And then they come up with new typologies in response to um, the situations. This is a workers dormitory where every worker has their own room and bathroom. And so for a lot of these workers who are rural migrants coming to the city, this is the best housing they have ever had. So um, a lot of villagers have really created uh, whole new categories of housing that because they are under the radar um, and because they have more freedom um, to actually design their own housing. Um, another interesting thing is uh, in China in the 1990s, uh, there were a lot of uh, so-called university towns built in which uh, all universities would move to a very specific site and they would all be together. Uh, in Guangzhou, uh, all the 10 all of Guangzhou's 10 universities had to move to this island um, that was planned actually by Sasaki. Um, uh, and uh, I think you can see very, very cleanly and neatly laid out. Um, so they built all the official uh, university buildings and then they went away. Um, so for the students who live there, they didn't really have a lot of needs being met. Um, for the kind of typical things any college town would provide, stores, restaurants, gathering spaces. And so the villagers um, got together and they created these um, spaces for small restaurants. And there are now more than 200 small restaurants in the village cre designed, created especially to serve all of these university 
uh, students who need to find cheap food. Um, and here's some of the creative things that have done. Um, this is a uh, ancestor hall um, that was no longer being used and it was turned into a love hotel. Again, one of the big problems of living in the dormitory with no other private spaces is that student couples don't have any places to go uh, for romance. And so there's a love hotel here, a hot pot restaurant and a bicycle shop. Um, on the right is a, uh, again, students don't have a collective space. So um, the villagers got to, students got together with other students from Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts and they designed this um, kind of uh, co-working space. And for example, when, when employers come to interview students, they will go to this co-working space and rent it. So basically kind of top down meets bottom up here um, to make a much better environment for the students um, in this place. Um, and just to finish that, there's a lot of work um, going on in China now, especially the work of Jason Ho, um, who runs something called Mapping Workshop, in which um, they map uh, the way in which uh, all of these um, spaces and people and objects work uh, in China. So um, this all leads up to everyday urbanism being um, print, uh, published in China. And the idea also, I mean, I'm talking about Los Angeles and China, um, two very, very different places, um, but many of the same principles are operative here. So I'm gonna end there and um, hope that there might be some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Margaret. It was astonishingly beautiful. Um, information and lecture and a way of looking at the cities. Uh, as Corbusier said, the houses for machine for living is the cities are actually is a machine for living. And we, we uh, got a chance to see your illustration of the cities as uh, many uh, useful uh, creating micro economies in cities can survive. Uh, it, it was so beautiful. You also run this program in, in, in UC Berkeley. Can you tell a couple words to our students who would like to follow up on this exciting urbanism areas and transfer to your program? Well, uh, I just want to say that if, uh, you know, I urge you to transfer to UC Berkeley, but I run a program called Berkeley Connect um, that is organized to welcome transfer students and to introduce you to each other and to introduce you to recent grads to know what they're doing. Uh, unfortunately, they don't do much everyday urbanism, but um, they can always take my classes. I've had some great students um, in taking my public space class, for example, who've come up with really amazing research. And certainly anybody who's been living in Los Angeles is gonna have a, some good examples. Now we'll, we'll, we'll take a few questions before we let you go, uh, having such a valuable speaker. Uh, are there any questions from the, from the audience that you could bring up? Brian's hot hand is up. As always, greetings, professors. Um, thank you for uh, such a wonderful uh, presentation today, um, Ms. Crawford. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, I have lived in Los Angeles my whole life. Uh, I've I've been a builder here as well, um, so I'm I'm seeing all of the wonderful have, have brought to the table, and um, and I've watched a lot of these different facets of that urbanism theory grow um, even to the point of like it was it was almost wild when the um, uh, the street vending thing was legalized in Los Angeles it was a massive explosion of some of the most incredible foods and you know unique clothing styles and a lot of homemade art artisans were able to get out and actually create you know commerce for themselves 
Um, but even long before then, um, I used to, uh, I'll tell a quick little story. I, I, I used to frequent a uh, swap meet. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with what they are, large outdoor flea market type environments, um, where um, I've been frequenting this lady who's been selling jeans in this very same spot for 25 years. And I've, been, I've bought all my jeans there. And I've always got a good fair price. And I've always got a good product. And the people around them have always been wonderful. She's always been an amazing person. Um, so to, to hear you bring such an intricate um, value and philosophy to the idea of how this concept works really kind of just almost cemented and solidified something that I've been experiencing my, um, pretty much my whole life you know, in Los Angeles. So I'm really thankful that you brought this to the table because it does affect how uh, architects look at design. We, you know, we try to make something that's better built environment, um, and we're trying to make something more powerful for humans to um, be able to experience and um, live their lives. And um, so I'm really thankful that you brought this to the table. And it's very, very exciting. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I just would say that one of my PhD students did his dissertations on swap meets in Los Angeles. And that's another entire, um, you know, a entire lecture could be devoted to that. So I'm glad. Thank you very much. Juan, do you have a question? I see your hand up. Yeah, I have a question. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, and I want to ask you, I am from Colombia. And as a kid, I would always see uh, street vendors and it wasn't really weird. Uh, it was always part of um, a daily life. And whenever I think of uh, something, you know, you know special uh, where I was from, I would always, I would always think of um, food from uh, food vendors like in the street. Um, and so I was wondering if you've uh, done more studies in other countries that is not maybe uh, here in the US or in China, if you've taken a look at some other countries. I, uh, you know, I haven't personally, but I, I certainly know that, I mean, many Latin American countries, um, street vending is a very normal activity. Certainly it is in Mexico. Um, so I think that I, in a way I'm, I'm convinced that this exists around the world and it's a very basic, um, it's a very basic urban activity. And so, um, in fact, there, there are books actually that collect different stories. Um, certainly in Asia, you find it everywhere. So yeah, I would say it's very universal. It's, uh, you know, it's the bottom of the uh, commercial activities, um, but it's very important for both buyers and sellers. Any more questions? I don't see any hands up. Okay, Yingali, yeah. Hi, Margaret. Um, you know, what, one of the recent changes that I, I'm, I'm certain you're more than aware of, I probably know more than anyone here, is, has to do with the accessory dwelling units. Um, and, you know, Los Angeles is the sort of epicenter of the ADU movement. And I'd be curious, where do you think that fits into your argument? Um, and can you think of other Cha recent change legislative changes um, that might be legalizing some of these uh, kind of everyday uh, movements. You mentioned many of them, but I'm just curious. You and then you talked about swap meets, but I'd be curious also. Does do you see ADUs as fitting into that, and are there others that you can think of? Well, the to me a very interesting thing. Yeah, I mean ADUs are a really good planning solution. <laughs> There's no question about it. It's excellent. The, the I guess a concern is that actually ADUs have been existing and going on for a long time. Um, many people exactly you know, uh, yeah. live in unpermitted uh, ADUs in my own neighborhood in the Berkeley Hills. Almost everybody has a tenant and a tenant space, but um, they will probably never become legalized. Um, because of the res uh, requirements that it takes, and, and in many respects, this the excuse me the the expense. <laughs> and so, I mean, this is some. I think this is something again that is very relevant. Um, somebody did a book in which they looked at. I I can't even remember it was the San Gabriel Valley or where. And there are all kinds of both economic and dwelling 
activities taking place in people's yards and garages and everything else, um, but they will never become official um, because the restrictions are so strong. Um, I should say this because maybe, uh, because I actually have an accessory dwelling unit, but it doesn't have two means of egress. Um, so it could never become legalized. So yeah, I think that this is something that, um, you know, it's, it's great. People should do it for sure. Architects should be involved. Um, they should make the cheap as cheap as possible. Um, and definitely it's, uh, it really changes, I think, density in a positive and good way. But also, you know, why not a little business back there too? You know, it could be, it could be expanded um, beyond dwelling. I mean, one of the big problems living here in this very desirable neighborhood in the Berkeley Hills is, you know, if somebody changed their garage into a store, it would be fantastic. You know, if you needed some milk or a loaf of bread, you could go there. Um, if there was a cafe, you wouldn't have to get in your car and drive. So it, it's actually a way of, I think, of making, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the 15-minute city. This this is actually the first step towards getting there. Margaret, I don't know if you have been in Turkey. Uh, um, I have been in Turkey, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a, a, yeah. We, in our neighborhoods, we don't, we don't have any zoning, of course, and I never seen anywhere else that what mixed use of city streets and neighborhoods, how beautifully they work and create community in the same time is like a wonderful way of supplying uh, your basic needs every day. There is a butcher next to it, is a vegetable place specialized on that next to it, is a, is a, a baker next to it, is a, a cafeteria to sit down and uh, socialize. It's a, I, when I first came here uh, in seventies, uh, I, I was hoping to see something similar to it. And I was so uh, surprised in a, in different direction, a reverse direction that how urbanistically the American cities of course i haven't been in new york at the time but it's only you know a couple three cities in entire u.s uh, i was so surprised that how clinical american cities were i stepped out from the place i was staying and there was this huge streets that no one on and gas stations on every corner i said oh my god do i have to go back it's really scared me and uh the way that uh, you are looking or bringing this up into architectural education level, I think is exactly what we need to be aware of it as uh, educators and also the students of architecture uh, to uh, how else we can design and use the cities. It's a really eye-opening work that you 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 have launched since the early days of your uh, teaching uh, practice. I just wanted to mention that and I want to tell all the students here that how important that is to look at cities from uh, uh, more humanistic angles like this rather than creating uh, iconic I mean we, we obviously we need iconic buildings as well but uh, but this is teaching and showing people and uh, that it is another life in the cities are actually more widespread and possible to uh, uh, include in our fold of designing places, designing cities. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, because, I mean, in a way, this is not supposed to replace any of those other kinds of urbanism. It really is on top of, adjacent to, uh, you know, around, uh, and and I think once people start noticing it, and in a way, the whole everyday urbanism conversation is really just about naming something that is there, uh, and that once it's named, people start noticing it and then trying to understand it. Thank you very much.
Margaret, I don't see any questions. Now I have to go back to my class and we are designing a community garden on top of the unused parking lot in our campus on that's the a, roof level. That's a, that's a great idea. That's wonderful. So thank you very much. And I hope to see some of you at UC Berkeley next year. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Ingalil. Okay. Take bye care. Bye.